Today, we're looking at a condition that sometimes causes people to become hermits. They don't want to leave their home because people point and stare or even ask questions like, what happened to your skin? Were you burned in a fire? Why are you turning white? Today, my topic is vitiligo. It's a skin condition that the king of pop, Michael Jackson, had. It is a disorder Georgia 4th District Congressman Hank Johnson has, along with millions of others, many of them children. Vitiligo is also a mystery and a financial burden, since many insurance companies consider some of its treatments cosmetics and won't cover the cost of some medicines. Joining me today to talk about vitiligo are Dr. Zakia P. Rice of Dermatology Associates of Georgia. She is one of three fellowship trained and board certified pediatric dermatologists in the state of Georgia. She is board certified in dermatology, pediatric dermatology, and pediatrics. Natasha Pierre McCarthy is the CEO and founder of National Vitiligo Bond, Inc. Foundation. She has vitiligo. Christina Maples, a retired Fulton County teacher with vitiligo, who just published her book, available on Amazon, Vitiligo, Black to White, My Personal Journey, Volume 1. Thank you all for being here. And Dr. Rice, what exactly is vitiligo? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us here. Um, vitiligo is an autoimmune disease um, that is caused by inflammation of the body attacking our pigment-making cells known as melanocytes. So what does that cause? So essentially it can present as white spots on the body and there's mainly two different forms. One can be segmental where it's just appearing on one side of your body, kind of in a unilateral presentation. And it can also be more widespread or diffuse, presenting on multiple parts of your body in a symmetric distribution. Who is more likely to get vitiligo? That's a great question. Um, I think vitiligo um, does not discriminate. So basically it affects um, all races, all ages, and both genders. So are we seeing an increase in vitiligo now? Perhaps. I think overall our studies and numbers are lacking. Um, there's probably more vitiligo, um, patients suffering from vitiligo than um, we know about, perhaps for fear of coming forward and presenting. Um, but uh, to answer your question, there could be an uptick in general or maybe with the help of uh, more community outreach, more people are coming forward. And that's the reason you founded, Ms. McCarthy, uh, Vitiligo Bond Incorporated. Yes. What does it do? Um, well, our organization uh, creates events for people with vitiligo for them to come on out because it is a disfiguring disorder and people tend to stay inside. And so we create events for them to come out and enjoy life, have fun, you know, and just interact with other people with no judgment. So we do a lot of that. So how young were you when you were diagnosed with vit vitiligo and how did it start? Yeah, I was about 27 at the time. And it started right here on my wrist. It was a tiny dot. I didn't know what it was. And um, I was like, what is this? You know, and I went to Cornell and had a, a biopsy of the skin and I waited. And then I found it was vitiligo. I never heard of vitiligo, right? And I uh, started some treatment. It didn't work well with me. And then I found out I was pregnant at the same time. So the uh, treatment were not going to work with my uh, pregnancy, so I had to stop the uh, treatment at that time. So, Ms. Maples, for you, how old were you when you were diagnosed? I was actually 33 when I was diagnosed, and it started with spots on my hands. Um, actually, on both hands, I had some very small white spots. And I went to a doctor that was actually a primary care doctor, and he was able to diagnose it pretty quickly that it was vitiligo. And so from there, um, it actually took its course pretty quickly. Um, I would say within three to four years, I had completely depigmented in the way that Michael Jackson presented. So I guess I'm living proof that it can happen in that way because I naturally depigmented. So it, you're looking at me, you can see the result. This is head to toe. Now, is that unusual for someone to depigment completely? So there are other patients who have had what we call auto depigmentation. And um, I think in terms of Natasha's story and Christina's story, seeing the different range um, is not uncommon. Uh, we can have presentations in childhood or later on in adulthood. 
um, or later on in life. Um, but seeing that range of some people just having one spot or multiple spots or completely auto depigmentation is not unusual. Um, both of these ladies are so courageous, and every time I talk with them, they inspire me so much to continue doing what I'm doing. So, Christina, I guess it's hard with vitiligo to continue doing what you're doing, e even in a department store. I was at a fashion fair uh, makeup counter, and there was a salesperson there that would help me with matching the makeup as my skin changed. And another young lady came by, and she looked, and she said, oh, how long have you had your burns? So for a lot of people, that's what it looks like. It looks to them as if, you know, yeah, you were mm -hmm. burned, if you had, you know, burned that caused your pigment loss. I guess the forefront came out with vitiligo was Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was the most public. Visible and public. Right, the most public and visible, even though he was not believed because of the extent. And that was it. People thought he was whitening his skin right. on purpose. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I can't say personally because I don't know him personally, but I can say you're looking at the exact same way that he looked in me. So I know that it's possible because it happened to me. Uh, the picture you showed me of you when you were very, very brown. Yes. And now you are completely white looking. Yes. And Is vitiligo inherited? So that's a great question, and, and I know we, we want to talk more about treatment, but I think it's first important to talk about um, what we understand about it, because with greater understanding comes greater treatments. I'm just going to be honest. We're disappointed in the medical profession at where we are in understanding our um, vitiligo, what's known about vitiligo. We do know there is a genetic predisposition, so meaning there's something in your genes or in your DNA that is set for this to potentially happen to you. And we've actually even located where it is on, on the chromosomes, chromosome 13, and we'll come back to that. But um, there's probably another th environmental factor that happens to turn um, vitiligo on. And we don't know what that is. Um, we don't know if it's infectious. We don't know if it's food. We don't know if it's a medicine. And that's where the research is really trying to dive in, not only at the mouse level, but also at the human level of understanding. So um, I've been on that journey since I found out I had it at the age of 28. Was trying to figure out, okay, I have it LIGO on the outside. What's going on inside? So I started to change my nutritional eating habits, introduce more greens into my diet. Um, also speak with um, their doctors in India um, that are doing good stuff for the LIGO. They have a lot of clinics. And I they agree. They're definitely leading. Holistic yep. <laughs> remedies. And they found with their data that people with vitiligo present with low vitamin D, B12, and then we also have triggers, um, Hashimoto. I just found out in, what was it, last year that I had Hashimoto, and that favors people with vitiligo. So I've probably been walking around with Hashimoto, which is low, founded, low functioning, mm -hmm. right, thyroid. It's a low thyroid. Mm -hmm. Vitiligo. I also have low stomach acid. I've been probably walking around with this stuff, and it probably tripped off stuff inside my body. So I think we are deficient internally, and I think we need to address those things. Yeah, at the That's genetic right? level, going mm -hmm. back to chromosome 13, those are all located side by side. Vitiligo, thyroid disease, pernicious anemia, which is a low vitamin B12, um, low vitamin D, lupus, and on and on and on. So and how do you treat? Overall, when I have a patient come to me for the first time for vitiligo, I break it down into five different areas. The first is just support. You know, after the correct diagnosis is made, that may or may not include a biopsy. Sometimes we can just look and we can see and know. But this is what you have. This is not contagious itself. We're still trying to learn more about it. Um, while this um, is a visible um, ailment, um, it is not just cosmetic. So really addressing any issues with um, anxiety or depression are very important. And along with um, kind of that first category, just making sure we're doing good skin care, mostly including sun protection, because the areas that don't have pigment are at higher risk of burn um, and trauma, and then subsequently um, skin cancers. When we return, taking a holistic approach to fighting vital... Now, there's a lot we don't know about vitiligo, but we do know it isn't contagious and it won't kill you. 
But Natasha, you're using a combination of traditional medicine and holistic medicine to treat your vitiligo? I've seen with the nutritional aspect, I have more vitiligo on my face. I, all this right here has been repigmented just with the change of diet. So that also plays a huge part. And I've been able to raise my vitamin D level up, you know, and I think that adds to it as well. I think it's like a holistic approach on this medicine and everything working together, I think will help the situation. Absolutely. Vitiligo is hard enough for an adult to deal with, but children, it's got to be really tough. What are you seeing with the children who come and whose parents end up coming to your organization? Um, they are looking for help. Um, basically, their kids are coming in and seeing that they're being bullied. And um, in the school setting, some of the teachers think the child with vitiligo is causing the problem. So I have to go in and advocate and let them know this is an actual skin disease and, um, you know, educate them on that level. And what we do is actually do career days and we educate the school. And if we could do an event, so just to let them know this is what it is. So we kind of make that kid a celebrity in the school, right? Well, you actually made one child a celebrity oh. with Girl Scout <laughs> cookies. <laughs> yeah, and that started off with the um, self-esteem project. And what we did was work with her because she was so low on her low um, self-esteem level. And we took photos of her in different settings. We took her out to the socials, just had fun with her. And, you know, it started bubbling up. And then um, someone saw her photo on social media. And it was a talent agency. And we worked with them. We spoke with them. We said, you know, she has self-esteem issues. And it's just a good project for her. And from there, we just moved on, and she had a couple of, you know, gigs, and, you know, she's having a good time. It's amazing. You know? It yeah. is amazing to <laughs> yeah. see this little girl yeah. on the box, yeah. and mm -hmm. that she does have vitiligo. Right, yeah, and that's like the first, you know, first of anything for her. What yeah. do the children say to you? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, sometimes children won't say things to their parents, uh -huh. because my parents can't understand what I'm going through because they're not going through it. Right. But they see an adult with their condition. Right. What do they say to you? Actually, they're happy. Uh, we had an event at Derma Blend um, a few months ago, and um, it was at Macy's Derma Blend. And there was a child, Alex, who was five. And that was the first time he's seen people with vitiligo. He had vitiligo too. And he was like, Mommy, I'm seeing people like me. You know, so it was like I changed his whole life. Because when I first got it, I thought I was the only one. So that's why the main bond, you know, bring people together and um, just let them know you're not alone, you know? So, yeah. And for you, Christy, uh -huh. how has it been that you educate others? Uh, well, actually, I have a book that just came out last week. Uh, so I talk about my personal journey. And also, I've partnered with um, Natasha, I was really glad when I was able to connect with her or her organization because there really isn't anything out there doing what she does, and she does it on such a personal level. So her organization has become a vehicle for me to get awareness and you know to speak to those things. And what she's done for children is just priceless. As a teacher, you know I saw what she sees in children and how it would manifest itself in the school environment into bullying. And so Natasha's playing a really important role in that because she goes in as an advocate for these children. And you talked about the um, psychological effect that it has. And I think that we need some type of partnership with some type of mental health uh, providers because it really is something that you should have some conversations about with professionals. And so I think that that's a very big component that is lacking, um, even for adults, and especially for adults, because people tend to forget that adults have feelings mm -hmm. and issues also. Mm -hmm. um, I myself, actually, after I started having more autoimmune uh, difficulties, couldn't understand the reception that I got from doctors that didn't understand what I was going through. And I started seeing a therapist and she brought up something interesting that I talk about in my book. Because, you know, with me fully depigmenting, people were just like, oh, you look fine. You know, you look good. 
And I think it's because there is a preference for lighter skin and whiter skin. And my thoughts were kind of tied together when I saw a therapist who was a Caucasian, Southern Christian woman. And when she said to me, I said, I can't understand why they're not understanding this is more than just a look. And I turned white. I was black and I turned completely white. And so she looked at me and she summed it up by saying, she said, well, if I woke up tomorrow morning and I was black, they would think it was a problem. Mm. And that kind of tied it into me, for me, of why no one was alarmed by the fact that I had turned white when I was black, because there's a preference. And it was looked at in, in the physical. But I don't want to go off on mm -hmm. children yes. either, but you know, mm -hmm. there are adults that need support also. That's, mm -hmm. I guess, what I'm trying to get across that needs some type of psychological so Dr. Christi Rice. I was just gonna say that was so heavy Christina what you're just talking about and I know we've talked about that before but but I think there's a presumed um, expectation that someone may prefer lighter skin to darker skin but a lot of my patients who are going through vitiligo whether they're auto depigmenting or they decide to actually depigment and we'll probably talk about that in terms of treatments so we get back to that um, that's a difficult transition, and, and, and sometimes they have to mourn the loss of their brown. Yeah. Well, so talk about the process of depigmentation, because that is one of the treatments. Yes, so going back, so two, step two out of five, so other treatment options include topicals. Um, in terms of just trying to get pigment back, those topicals we usually go to include topical corticosteroids or topical calcineur calcineurin inhibitors. And there's a few coming out on the market known as jack kinase inhibitors. So stay tuned, those have not yet been approved. But um, if someone has deep pigment to the point where they have at least 20% um, total body surface loss of color, then they are now eligible to actually completely depigment. And this is actually only one FDA-approved treatment for vitiligo. Ironically, it happens to be a treatment that causes depigmentation rather than getting pigment back, and that's the use of monobenzone. And typically, we'll use monobenzone from as low as 20% um, to as high as 40%. Um, and it's a process. Is it and taken internally, or is it applied? It's a, it's a topical application. And you know, can, Christina can share her hands-on experience with doing that last area of her forehead. But you know, sometimes if they're starting at 80 or 60%, that's a year process to completely depigment, and you're doing it one body part at a time, and so to speak. how expensive is it? Yes. Well, um, I naturally depigmented. depigmented, except for a few spots that I had on my leg and a strip on my forehead. Um, so I did use depigmentation for those areas, but I, it didn't take but a few months because it was such a small, small area. area. But for someone but else. It was very expensive. At that time, and this was, mind you, like I said, like 20 years ago, it was 700 and some dollars for a pound of this solution. Mm -hmm. Now, like I said, I'm just treating small areas. I couldn't even imagine what it would be like to have, and then it was specially made. Yeah, that's wow. It, I don't know if it still yep, is. Yep, it's still specially compounded. It, I had to contact, actually, um, a pharmacy in another state, and the doctor had to uh, actually talk to the pharmacist because they wouldn't prescribe it just to anybody. And, and does uh, insurance cover it? So even though it is FDA approved, unfortunately, no, they don't. Um, they consider it to be cosmetic, cosmetic. which is- Cosmetic? Yes. Something yes. that needs to be worked on, obviously. Uh, this yeah. is why we reached out to Congressman Hank Johnson. And um, I let him know about the problems that we've been having. And he has vitiligo. He has vitiligo, but he did not know um, about the insurance companies dropping patients when they're treating this lifestyle disorder. So um, what he did was write a letter um, to the insurance company. So we are waiting to hear back what happens um, in regards to that. You know. Well, I know he also uh, got Congress to recognize June as Vitiligo Awareness Month. Congressional record, paying tribute to the month. And then he actually introduced a bill as well for October to address the mental health issues around uh, vitiligo to bring up more discussions about you know what can we do we need funding for this you know because it is an underserved population mm -hmm. 
and um, he's done that and we're so grateful. And I think we say it's an underserved population, but that population numbers something like 75 million? Yes, mm -hmm. worldwide, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And about what, 5 million? 5 in million U.S. US. Yeah. 5 million Which US. is mm -hmm. about 5%. That's about so 5%. Dr. Rice, right. you, you gave us 1, 2, yep. and 3. So 3, um, I'll put 3 and 4 together, because 3 is actually systemic uh, treatment, so that's treatments you take by mouth. So classically, that includes prednisone or corticosteroid um, or a corticosteroid sparing agent. That's not used a lot, again, because that risk-benefit profile is out of whack. There's more risk to taking systemic medications to the benefit. Um, but sometimes it's needed, especially in, an, in a progressive case uh, that's proceeding pretty quickly to try to stop that progression. You know, we will at times grab for one of those oral medications. But then four is using um, minimally invasive therapy, largely through light. And so um, UV, UVB, UVA, or Sorolin with UVA is um, a light option. And then um, a newer option, which I'm enjoying, is using an eczema laser. And so it's you know, same light treatment, but it's a laser because it's only one wavelength of light. And so that wavelength is 508 nanometers for anyone who wants to know that. Sorry for nerding out on y'all. <laughs> but it works quite well. And so, um, you know, we definitely still have kids that go in the light booth, adults as well. But the eczema laser to me has been a great uh, tool that um, I now have at uh, my disposal at uh, Dermatology Institute of Georgia. And number five? And number five is invasive, um, but it's actually tolerated quite well well. And um, one of my colleagues, um, who these ladies know very well, Dr. Sula Van Darker, has been doing some of this work at Emory. It's uh, called melanocyte transfer. So it's essentially taking um, melanocytes, again, the cells that make pigment, from one area of your body, taking it, spinning it down a, a test uh, tube, isolating that melanocyte, or those groups of melanocytes, taking the affected area, dermabrading it down, or essentially causing a a scrape on the top of the skin and then painting those melanocytes right on top of that area. Yes. And after a bandage That's is on, yes, right. <laughs> after a bandage is on, removing that bandage and um, there's a great success with repigmentation with that and also a nice safety profile yes. too. Wow. <laughs> you know, that is amazing. <laughs> that interests me so much. When um, she talked about the uh, procedure she just spoke of, it's like I said, I went through it 20 years ago. None of that was available or even thought of. And it's interesting, in my journey, I did talk to the doctors about, well, when you cut yourself or you have an injury, sometimes pigment will show up there. Yeah. And I said, is there any way to use that? And now science has actually caught up caught with up. the idea that I thought of, and mm -hmm. they are using that to repigment. So I was going to say at the beginning of this hour, I really don't need to be here because both Natasha and Christina are doctors in this field with that uh, comment right there being um, case in point. Oh, no, no, well, no, 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 we, 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 we still need you. Know, we needed that yes. medical expert, yes. Well, in order to raise awareness, you are having the third annual Community Vitiligo Awareness 5K Walk and Run on May 25th on the Beltline. Funds raised will go to what? Well, funds raised will go towards what we do in the community, the awareness portion, and then also we uh, partnered with the oldest charity, the American Vitiligo Research Foundation, and they're actually raising funds for research um, at Harvard. So we're actually doing that to help the community and to bring better awareness and educational programs in the community and to keep doing what we're doing. Well, for more information, you can go to vitiligobond.org. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you Ms. for having Maples, me. Ms. McCarthy, for sharing your knowledge about vitiligo. That's it for me. Next week, the real meaning behind Memorial Day. It's much more than the official start of summer. Learn about fallen heroes of Georgia and one of the biggest Memorial Day parades right here in your own backyard. Up next, Wanda Black and Brother T with Good News Gospel. I'm Monica Pearson for KISS 104.1, leaving you with Mama Hattie's favorite saying, it's what you do with what you have that makes you what you are. Enjoy the rest of your day.